The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, Old Testament scholar Dr. John McKenna describes the importance of the vicarious humanity of Christ. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for being with us again, Dr. McKenna. You're very kind, Mike. It's always Thank a you. pleasure to get together, and you bring a great deal to our viewers, and we appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. I'd like to begin today by reading a quotation from a book. I'm reading uh, from The Mediation of Christ by Thomas F. Torrance. To preach the gospel of the unconditional grace of God in that unconditional way is to set before people the astonishingly good news of what God has freely provided for us in the vicarious humanity of Jesus. To repent and believe in Jesus Christ and commit myself to Him on that basis means that I do not need to look over my shoulder all the time to see whether I have really given myself personally to Him whether I really believe and trust Him, whether my faith is at all adequate, for in faith it is not upon my faith, my believing, or my personal commitment that I rely, but solely upon what Jesus Christ has done for me in my place and on my behalf, and what He is and always will be as He stands in for me before the face of the Father. That means that I am completely liberated from all ulterior motives in believing or following Jesus Christ, for on the ground of His vicarious human response for me, I am free for spontaneous, joyful response and worship and service as I could not otherwise be. As I said, that's uh, Thomas F. Torrance, The Mediation of Christ. You were a student of Thomas Torrance. You studied under him and knew him personally. Uh, in today's program, we'd like to talk about uh, briefly who Thomas Torrance was as he passed away recently and what is this vicarious humanity of Jesus Christ that he is talking about that I just read. I'm very happy that you read that sentence and, and mentioned that Tom has gone to be with our Lord in heaven. Uh, the last time we spoke together in his uh, nursing home, uh, he said to me as soon as he got to heaven, he would look up Karl Barth and find out what Barth thought about the direction in which he had taken Barth's uh, theology. Uh, it was a rather long sentence, or three sentences, difficult to understand. We've already talked about the freedom of God to be uh, as he is with his grace uh, in the Old Testament the last time we talked. And we, we spoke about the way that God, as his grace, had become the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was our Savior. And this sentence on the vicarious humanity has to do with all that God was able to achieve by embodying himself uh, in Jesus Christ and what that means for us. So I'm very glad to think about Tom being in heaven and you and I sitting here uh, becoming liberated as, uh, as Christ applies his, uh, his life to us. That's the vicarious humanity, the way that God is free to, um, to give us his, his Christ in his spirit uh, as the revelation of the Father uh, our Father and His Father. Vicarious humanity, being human for us in our place and on our behalf. Uh, Thomas Torrance brings up the concept of, I don't have to worry about my repenting being good enough because Jesus is repenting for me. How does yeah. that work? Yeah, that's a. Uh... That's a wonderfully uh, relieving, <laughs> delivering uh, kind of concept once, you, once you're able to lay hold of it. Actually, both the Torrances in Scotland there, James Torrance and, and Thomas Torrance, 
were, were champions of this, of this concept. James taught it all across the world while he was alive. That is, he saw all Christian worship as having a tendency to be something that we do, the church does. We thank God. We sing hymns. We pray. We do this. We do that. We and, beca take, and because we do, we take communion. God is pleased with us. Yes. And, and to that, for James Torrance, was putting on its head the real meaning of worship. It is Christ who is obedient to the Father. It is the Spirit that Christ has sent that runs the church. So it's what the Spirit does, not what the church does, that provides that kind of worship which is of the Father. So he was, they were always trying to uh, convert people from themselves, from that kind of self-centeredness. It isn't what we do. From beginning to end, it is what Christ does for us. Christ is our worship. So our faith is in Christ, not in how well we do the things we ought to do. Where our faith is in Christ who did all those things for us perfectly. And he did it not just on the cross or in his resurrection. He did it with the wholeness of his life. A wholeness of a life that is continuing. It, it, he lives even today. In the incarnation, you have to think of the word become flesh as the embodiment of God's grace and truth and covenant relationship with Israel. And you have to think of Jesus Christ as this grace and truth coming to be baptized on the part of sinners. John the baptizer is, is baptizing with water sinners so that they can uh, repent. And no wonder John said, well, why should I baptize you knowing that here is the Lamb of God who is no, is no sinner, who has no sin. Yeah, the, 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 the texts tell us that the baptizer recognized the Messiah and, and, and knew that the one coming after him was greater than him. So how, how is it that he could be baptizing Jesus? Well, Jesus says to him, well, suffer it to be done according to all righteousness. That is, he enters into the place of the sinner in baptism. He enters into, uh, the kind, makes the kind of repentance as a sinner that repentance truly is, something that the sinner uh, cannot do. Um, the, the motto there with both Torrances was, uh, uh, unless you know the grace of God for you, unless you know God's forgiveness, there's no way you can repent. So it isn't that you repent and then God is gracious. It's that God is gracious, repent. And the one who did it as a man is the man, Jesus Christ. God has already done for you everything the necessary. And then on, on Therefore, all the way through everything. Obedience to the Father, obedience even uh, to accepting the evil against God that, that is the world on the cross. And finally, his resurrection to justify all that, uh, that he came to do. Now, many, many people think uh, that the act of our, our repenting and believing causes God to change his mind toward us right. and, uh, and, and apply the blood of Christ to us at that point. But that's not what is going on at all. Then. When you do that, the, Tom used the phrases uh, looking over your shoulder. You're always wondering. Did I do it well enough? Yeah. <laughs> and the answer is no. And who, none of us ever do it well enough. Even at my best, I need forgiveness. Let alone, you should see me at my worst. And our confidence lies in the fact that it is Jesus being righteousness for us that... Yeah is the basis on which we're restored to right relationship, we're saved. He takes us, uh, he takes us up totally. The early fathers and the t both of the Torrances use it often. Uh, in this act, uh, uh, they would say what has not been taken up 
has not been saved. The unassumed is the unhealed. Salvation is the healing of the whole man. In other words, when Jesus became human, don't a lot of Christians think well, that he became human as the, the perfect human. He did not take our broken, sinful human nature on himself. Right. He only took the pre-fall right. or pre uh, the, the Adam before the sin kind of nature. Right. But, but what you're saying is that he took our actual sinful nature on himself and that had to be true in order for it to be healed. What he took, he took what um, he assumed, that's what's yeah. healed. He took Adam's sin, he took Abraham's sin, he took Moses' sin, he took David's sin, he took the house of David fallen from God upon himself. Now isn't there something about that in Romans 8, uh, the first few verses yeah. there that specifically, tell I, us that. And I think St. Paul is, is, is trying to say that, that the reason there's no condemnation for the sinner is because Christ has done this for the sinner. Well, let's read that, that passage. Right. Uh, Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit it's his assumption of, or taking on of this sinful flesh that allows us now to be uh, walking in righteousness, but it's not our own righteousness. It's the right, it's his. From beginning to end, it's grace and truth that he is for us. Um, so when we say that Jesus, that we don't need to worry about whether we repent well enough and so on, and we say Jesus repents for us, we don't mean, well, Jesus is a sinner and he's got to repent. We mean... He was willing in his freedom as God to do this for us. Um, we certainly couldn't do it for he ourselves. He takes my broken prayers. He takes my wounded soul. He takes my uh, fragmented mind. He takes up all of that and in the wholeness of who he is presents me to his Father and our Father. So when we talk about the Christian faith being a life lived in faith as opposed to a life of following rules. We're not talking about, isn't there kind of a razor's edge that Christians tend to walk? On one side, we know that we are saved by grace and we trust God in faith to be merciful to us, to forgive us, but on the other side, we think, we know that God doesn't do this just so that we can continue to be uh, in rebellion and, and, and live a sinful life. On the other side, we want to walk in the kind of righteous way that Jesus taught us and that we, as Paul put it, ought to walk because we are uh, saved. How does that come together? Because it, he lifts me to his father, that I might live before his father as his brother. Well, that's, not, that's a long way from license, isn't it? Grace has nothing to do with uh, the freedom to sin. It's a complete liberty from death and evil and sin. It's, and yet it's we, freedom. Yet we find ourselves still falling short. We find ourselves still participating in sin. That's why uh, it's important that we learn how to forgive one another. And we can't learn that any place except with Christ in the Father, in the Father-Son relationship. Uh, the vicarious humanity of 
of, of God in Christ for us is there fully um, mediating to us his grace and his truth, his life, his light, his word. Uh, that's where we live as believers in Jesus Christ. We, we don't have to look over our shoulder to see uh, if we've done it well enough. We haven't. And at the same time, we care about that. It isn't as though we say, I don't care. Like prodigals, though. Uh, you know, yes, Father. Um, who says yes to the Father? Jesus Christ says yes to our Father for us. Even when we are still willing to say no to the Father, Christ will not be who he is without us. Remember, we said that uh, the Father-Son relation in Hosea 11. So in the Father-Son relation, we learn love and grace and truth as, it, as, as he is eternally, Father-Son in the spirit. That's what makes, uh, well, Baxter Kruger's ministry so important in, uh, in Mississippi because you, you, with, through the vicarious humanity of God in Christ, you begin in the father-son relation to seek to understand who you are as a child of his kingdom. There's an awful lot involved in the vicarious humanity. Uh, the, it, when you want to flesh out the meaning of the concept of vicarious humanity, you're always answering the question, who is Jesus really? Uh, on the same, or across the page from what, what we just read, uh, is this comment that uh, is so uh, also meaningful in terms of how we even present the gospel to others. Uh, we, there's this tendency to present the gospel, uh, the good news, as, as uh, God uh, d is not, uh, does not love you yet, but God, Jesus has done these things and you can take advantage of that if, if you do certain things. If you uh, pray a prayer of repentance and ask God to come in your life, then he'll change his mind toward you. And Thomas Torrance says uh, this, how then is the gospel to be preached in a genuinely evangelical way? Surely in such a way that full and central place is given to the vicarious humanity of Jesus as the all-sufficient human response to the saving love of God which he has freely and unconditionally provided for us. We preach and teach the gospel evangelically then in such a way as this. And here's how he, he gives what the message actually is to us as, as unbelievers, but it's a reminder of the way we stand as believers as well. God loves you so utterly and completely, and this is to unbelievers. God loves you so utterly and completely that he has given himself for you in Jesus Christ, his beloved son, and has thereby pledged his very being as God for your salvation. In Jesus Christ, God has actualized his unconditional love for you in your human nature in such a way once for all that he cannot go back upon it without undoing the incarnation and the cross and thereby denying himself. He died for you precisely because you are sinful and unworthy of him and has already made you his own before and apart from your ever believing in him. And then he goes on to say that because all this is true, Therefore, renounce yourself, take up your cross, and follow. The assurance we have in, in, in salvation, of our salvation, doesn't lie in how, how well we do everything. It lies in our faith, or, or we sense it because we trust in Jesus. Our faith gives us that assurance and window on what is absolutely already true that God has already yeah. done. At least that's how I... I Right. see this uh, Torrance presenting what we just read in Romans chapter 8. Right. I've heard him also say, um, uh, you, if, when you understand God in this way for you, you have to understand that God loves you more than he loves himself. Uh, recently, as I've been learning this kind of love through the vicarious humanity of Christ for me, uh, 
the one who presents me to his father in the spirit. Um, I've been watching people and I know that naturally they do not believe they're loved. And they're always seeking to be loved one way or another. <laughs> but just sitting there watching them and you can, you can actually get a feel, or I can get a feel for this, they are unloved and they know that. And they're always trying to, to do something to get love, <laughs> to be loved. Probably the big, their biggest problem is this. God so loved the world that he gave. This is the way he's chosen in his freedom as his grace to love the world, to love these people. And the accusation is because in his freedom he's chosen to love in this way and not in some other way, well, then he's some kind of narrow God. <laughs> he's not a universal God. And so we have a problem there understanding that the particular is the universal. The singular way that God has chosen to show his love in the world is something we despise because we despise that kind of uh, particularity. You mean the fact that Jesus... Something new? It, it something not, particular is also universal. So the fact that he is a, a, is a Jew, the fact that he's a man very much so. and not a woman, a very Jew much so. and not anyone else, very much so. and the fact that you must believe in him as opposed to some other thing that we come up with as humans Absolutely are despi all particular. Absolutely despicable. We, we prefer our cows, we said. We, we'd rather kiss our cows than know this love for us. And yet this particular, uh, this particularity of Jesus yeah. is actually how everyone is saved. It is not restricted it is the universal. to just a certain kind of, of person or certain yeah. part of humanity. He is the one God. He said the God of the old as his grace uh, is the God of the new as his grace embodied, yes. So it's something new. Probably the, the, the accusation that he, he, that we can accuse him of being narrow-minded for choosing this particular way and the way that we prefer to kiss our, our cows is the fundamental. Cows, you're referring to the, the gold, our all idols. the way back to the, the, our the golden calf yeah. that Israel. Yeah, we referred. would rather have our idols save us than the great I am that God is. And yet, uh, this sense of n not being loved, needing love, looking for love, <laughs> is, it seems to be a plague of our time. Uh, who uh, doesn't, even in, in marriages, uh, and, and the, in families, we, when we disappoint one another, but we can't see past uh, our own weaknesses. To, uh, love ha doesn't have a chance. But in the gospel, we are saying that God already loves you, even while you're before, before you've ever believed or even heard. Yeah, sure, sure. That's a very serious move that he's made on us. And... We're going to have to take it seriously uh, sooner or later. So the fact that God does love everyone means that everyone has to take it seriously at some point because he's never going to let up. He doesn't call anyone uh, somewhere else besides to himself. All people are called to him. If I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to yeah. myself, Jesus said. Yeah. So Men in the sense of if all you people. object to that, uh, the, you know, you, that's, that's a problem you're having with God. And that's, again, like Israel, who it's a problem was always she has a with struggle God. as a type of the way everyone is. Sure. And as such, Israel even today serves as uh, the disobedient servant to, uh, to show us, to bear witness to, to give testimony to the fact that this is the way he's chosen to love. And even those of us who are believers uh, walk in that same path much of the time in our... We said uh, uh, stiff-necked, high-handed, murmuring, self-centered, 
uh, wicked. We turn to God, and yet then we we keep wanting to turn back. If you're normal, <laughs> you because we like that which we're habitually familiar with much better than it than something really new. We like that much better. We're always trying to get back. Uh, if I if I think about um, uh, my time uh, in the Haight Ashbury, for instance, and people desperately looking for love you know, in the in those sixties, and the kind of nostalgia that exists in our nation today for those times, uh, where there was at least a recognition could, that we knew what we were looking for. Well, we, we were looking for love, and we knew it. Yeah. Well, I don't Find know that we knew what not. love was, but we. We knew we needed something besides what we had. As usual, uh, you, you get into something very interesting that we'd really like to explore when they, we've only got 30 or 40 seconds left. New, new. The vicarious humanity introduces us to a concept that takes us into the new creation, the new world of God in Christ for us. And that newness is not something necessarily having to do with what we already know. We really do have to be willing to become something new to accept him as the love he is for us. Assurance of salvation is something that people want. It's right there in him. And it's there in him all the time, not in anything we do. Our faith Never. is only in the fact of his love for us, not in anything that we can conjure if up or worry about. If you're looking for assurance in what not. you can do, you're never going to have it. And so our assurance is absolute because it's he, in Christ. He is who he is. I am who I am. You tell him I am has sent you. Well, when Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am, he was saying, I'm here. I've been sent. And I'm the one. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.